Um, I wanted to turn to today and the response of the U.S. Um, uh, leaders. Uh, you had uh, President Obama actually tweeting, I believe, after Donald Trump, the president elected. First, he tweeted, uh, Fidel Castro is dead, exclamation point. Then condemned the late Cuban leader in a statement issued hours after Castro's death. Um, the statement read, not clear who wrote it or tweeted it, the world marks the passing of a brutal dictator who oppressed his own people for nearly six decades, Fidel Castro his legacy is one of firing squads, theft, unimaginable suffering, poverty, and the denial of fundamental human rights. Um, <clears throat> and then that was Donald Trump. This is Donald Trump's senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway. We're allowing commercial aircraft there. We pretend that we're actually doing business with the Cuban people now, when really we're doing business with the Cuban government and the Cuban military. He's been very clear that the major priority now is to make sure Cubans on Cuba have the same freedoms that Cubans here in America have, which is political, religious, and economic freedom, make sure those political prisoners are finally released right. into freedom, and make sure the American fugitives face the law. So that's Kellyanne Conway. Peter Kornblue, can you respond to her description and also talk about what this means for today, as this all takes place um, in this period uh, leading into a Donald Trump presidency and what this means? I, I can. Uh, but let me just follow up on Lou Perez's point by t saying a, a very personal anecdote. When news uh, very early Saturday morning came in that Fidel Castro had died, I, I spoke to a very special friend of mine from Peru, and she said to me, for all most of my life, he was a hero uh, to me for standing up uh, to the United States. Um, and certainly throughout Latin America and much of the Third World, uh, that, I think, was a, pre a prevalent thought about Fidel's uh, passing. Uh, he stood up to the United States. He gave pride, nationalism, self-determination, sovereignty, independence um, uh, to Cuba, but also created a model and an aspiration for many other peoples and many other countries in the Third World that, that had been under the thumb of, of uh, the United States um, uh, for, for, for many years. Uh, you know, we're in a very delicate moment right now with the election of Donald uh, Trump. Trump, in September, went to Miami and tried to garner hardline Cuban-American votes by saying that uh, he was going to rescind and reverse all of the executive orders that Barack Obama had made to move the process of normalization of relations with Cuba forward, uh, and that he would reverse those that process unless the Cubans gave in to our demands, gave in to our uh, uh, and, and made concessions to the United States. And I can tell you from being in Cuba often that the word concession is a, a, a true four-letter word uh, in, in, in Cuba. Um, uh, it uh, leads to almost an explosive negative reaction, the idea that Cuba would ever make any concessions uh, to the United States. Uh, that is the pride they have in the, in the revolution. What Obama has done is not made a bad deal with Cuba. He hasn't made any deal with Cuba at all. He had said to the Cubans, we are going to move forward in the interest of U.S. policy, uh, in the interest of our relations with the rest of Latin America, uh, and in our own interest that, um, that we should have a different relationship with you, and we think it's going to have an impact on your society, on your economy, and on your politics over the long term. But we're going to move forward towards normal relations, and you can join us if you want, or if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, and the Cubans have always wanted normal relations with the United States. The secret declassified history of Fidel's efforts to reach out to the United States in between speeches denouncing imperialist Yankees uh, is very clear in the book that Bill Leo Grant and I did, Back Channel to Cuba. Fidel wanted the validation uh, uh, for the Cuban Revolution of having a peaceful coexistence with the United States. Uh, and, as Lou Perez so uh, importantly pointed out, Cuba preferred not to live in the shadow of the security threat from the Colossus of the North. They would much prefer not to have the threat of U.S. intervention hanging over them, and that's what normal relations would eventually mean to them. And now we have a situation where Trump may want to roll back 
these great gains that are happening at this very moment with these direct flights to Havana and tens of thousands of Americans going— Landing as uh, we speak for the first time, as we speak. direct I mean, flight. This is a, a dramatic moment, uh, and it's really the moment in which um, U.S. citizens and the, the citizens around the world are going to have to really organize to, to, to press uh, for a continuation of this very important process of peace and dignity and harmony between the United States and Cuba, which is now uh, being threatened by the position of the incoming President Donald Trump. And your response to the description of Fidel Castro as a brutal dictator, Peter? Well, listen, Fidel Castro was an authoritarian. He ruled with a, an iron fist. Um, uh, there was repression and uh, is repression in, in Cuba. Uh, in his uh, in, in Fidel's kind of argument, uh, he did it in the name of a different kind of democracy, a different kind of freedom, uh, the freedom from illness, uh, the, the, uh, the freedom from racism, the freedom from, from social inequality. Um, and Cuba has a lot of very positives that, that all the other countries that we don't talk about don't have. There isn't gang violence in Cuba. People aren't being slaughtered uh, around the streets by, by guns uh, every day. Um, uh, when they defeated the Zika virus uh, right away, um, there is uh, universal health care uh, and, uh, and universal education. So, um, I mean, these are, this is the debate uh, over the legacy of, of well, Fidel Castro. We're gonna but the more we're going to have to leave it there, but I thank you so much for being with us, and we'll continue this discussion. Thanks to our guest, Peter Kornblu, director of the Cuba Documentation Project at the National Security Archive, co-author of Back Channel to Cuba, The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. Thanks to Lou Perez, professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, author of Cuba, Between Reform and Revolution, and Bill Fletcher, columnist for BlackCommentator.com, founder of the Black Radical Congress. And that does it for our show. I'll be interviewing Bernie Sanders tomorrow on the show. Please send us your questions at stories at democracynow.org. And check out our 20th anniversary celebration, December 5th. Check our website, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.